It, can I share my screen now or? Yes. Okay, I gotta, let's see. Wait a minute. Let's see. Okay. Let's one more, one more interruption. The uh, morning of reflection is by Zoom. It is by Zoom. Can Can everybody see? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, we are talking about the incarnation and the the promises of God that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ uh, in his incarnation. Uh, this, uh, I started out with a quote by Arch, Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen. They've, his cause for canonization has been open for a while and he's a venerable. Um, he wrote a book many years ago called The Life of Christ, which I highly recommend. He's very readable. Uh, he would spend an hour before the Blessed Sacrament every single day in prayer, and it shows in his writings because he doesn't just write from an intellectual point of view, but from the heart. And you can, you can see that he meditates on these truths and brings them into his heart. Um, another really good book that he wrote is called The World's First Love, which is about the Blessed Mother, and it's one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. So I also, one of the handouts you got is an excerpt from The Life of Christ. And this is like the, the title of the opening chapter is The Only Person Ever Pre-Announced. And I don't know if any of you have had a chance to read it. It's just like three or four pages, the excerpt you were sent. But what's really interesting about Jesus is that he wasn't just pre-announced in the scriptures. Uh, there even in pagan cultures, they had this like an, a sense or an idea or a prophecy that someone was coming into the world who was going to save us, which I didn't know that until I read this. So this is uh, Tacitus, who was an ancient Roman. He says, People were generally persuaded in the faith of the ancient prophecies that the East was to prevail and that from Judea was to come the master and ruler of the world. Suetonius, in his account of the life of Vespasian, recounts the Roman tradition thus, quote, It was an old and constant belief throughout the East that by indubitably certain prophecies, the Jews were to attain the highest power. And then it says China had the same expectation, but because it was on the other side of the world, it believed that the great wise man would be born in the West. The annals of the celestial empire contained the statement, in the year, in the 24th year of Chao Wang of the dynasty of the Chiu, on the eighth day of the fourth moon, a light appeared in the Southwest, which illumined the king's palace. The monarch, struck by its splendor, interrogated the sages. They showed him books in which this prodigy signified the appearance of the great saint of the West, whose religion was to be introduced into their country. The Greeks expected him, for Aeschylus, in his Prometheus, six centuries before Jesus' coming, wrote, Look not for any end, moreover, to this curse until God appears, to accept upon his head the pains of thy own sins vicarious. So there's more. I'm not going to read more of those, but I think it's very interesting that, that God doesn't give us foreknowledge of Jesus's coming, not just to those who specifically received divine revelation, the Jews, but also to pagans around the world so that they would know to expect the Savior uh, Jesus fulfilled over a hundred prophecies from the Old Testament, and I tried to find an exact number, and it ranged anywhere from 100 to 400, so I'm just saying over 100 prophecies from the Old Testament uh, regarding the promised Messiah. And Professor Peter Stoner, who was the chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena City College, calculated the statistical probability of one person 
fulfilling only eight of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament was one in 10 to the 17th. And I don't even know how to say that number. I wrote it out there. And then the probability of fulfilling only 48 jumps to one in 157. So the fact that Jesus even fulfilled, if he had only fulfilled 48, that was just an astronomical probability. So we know, we know Jesus is the one that's foretold in the Holy Scripture. Now there's, I'm just going to give you a couple of prophecies that were given in the Old Testament. I mean, again, there's over a hundred, so we can't go over them all. But this is one of my favorite. This is from the book of Wisdom, uh, Wisdom chapter 2. Now, this is the most recent book of the Old Testament. It's dated anywhere between uh, 30 to like 100 BC before Christ. And this is a, a prophecy. It says, let us lie in wait for the righteous one because he is annoying to us. He opposes our actions, reproaches us for transgressions of the law and charges us with violations of our training. He professes to have knowledge of God and styles himself a child of the Lord. To us, he is the censure of our thoughts. Merely to see him is a hardship for us because his life is not like that of others. And different are his ways. He judges us as debased. He holds aloof from our paths as from things impure. He calls blessed the destiny of the righteous and boasts that God is his father. And this is something that a Jew would not do. Let us see whether his words be true. Let us find out what will happen to him in the end. For if the righteous one is the son of God, God will help him and deliver him from the hand of his foes. With violence and torture, let us put him to the test, that we may have proof of his gentleness and try his patience. Let us condemn him to a shameful death. According to his own words, God will take care of him. So that sounds a lot like the Pharisees and their uh, extreme antagonism towards Jesus, their, you know, their intent to kill him and to have him crucified. Now, Psalm 22 this one, the opening line is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And this is what Jesus speaks from the cross. And a lot of people, when they read that passage, they think Jesus is emitting a cry of despair, but he's not. He's actually engaging in a rabbinical teaching method, which is to recite the first verse of a psalm, to direct you to that psalm. So that's what he's doing. And this psalm is a prophecy of his passion. And this is just an excerpt. It's not the whole psalm here. And it says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They curl their lips and jeer. They shake their heads at me. He relied on the Lord, let him deliver him. If he loves him, let him rescue him. Many bulls surround me, fierce bulls of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions that rend and roar. Like water, my life drains away, all my bones are disjointed. My heart has become like wax, it melts away within me. As dry as a potsherd is, in my, is my throat, my tongue cleaves to my palate. You lay me in the dust of the death. Dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. And this part is, is quoted in uh, one of the Gospels when the soldiers were casting lots for Jesus' clothes. And then his uh, disjointed bones, his throat dry, the tongues. This is all what happens when you're crucified. You know, he had nothing to drink. He's on the, the cross for hours and some hung on the cross for days. So thirst was something they experienced. So these are just two examples of very specific prophecies related to Jesus. Now going to the promises, these go very to the very beginning of the Bible. Uh, the Proto-Evangelium, which means the first gospel in Latin, is Genesis 3.15, and this is right after the fall, and, G and God immediately gives us hope right after Adam and Eve fall and, you know, take humanity with them in, in 
being in a having a corrupt human nature corrupted by sin and God says to them he says I will put enmity between you and the woman he's speaking this to the serpent between your your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel so let's break this prophecy down so when he says her seed he says her seed and in Semitic cultures, the seed, which is another word for offspring, was considered from the man, not the woman. So in Semitic culture, this would have been written his seed, you know, not the seed of the woman. And so this is actually also John, a prophecy. Yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but Jose, I just text you something important. I'm so sorry. Or no problem. Oh, okay. Do I need to see that? No, just Jose. Oh, okay. Okay. So this prophecy is actually a prophecy of the virginal conception and birth of Christ because he had no human father. So he's the seed of the woman and the woman is the blessed mother. Then the prophecy goes on to say, I'll put enmity between you, which is the serpent, which is the devil and the woman. So the enmity is total opposition. And again, this is pointing to Mary, who's the woman in this prophecy in her immaculate conception. In her immaculate conception, which we haven't talked about yet, but just means she was created without original sin. She was created in a state of grace. And so she did not have a wounded nature like the rest of us. So she was never under the dominion or influence of Satan. So her opposition to Satan was total and complete. And then the prophecy, he, referring to her seed, Jesus, shall bruise your head. That's also in other translations, it's strike or crush. So Jesus will strike a definitive destructive blow to Satan. And then he goes on to say, you, the serpent, will bruise his heel. So Jesus will suffer. He will be wounded by the serpent, but it's temporary. He's not going to be destroyed. And then John 19, 17. It says, in carrying the cross himself, he, Jesus, went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. So three of the Gospels explain the meaning of the word Golgotha. And, you know, when I first read the New Testament, I didn't really know why they gave the name. Uh, it's in the Gospels of John, Mark, and Matthew. But the meaning of Golgotha is given because Calvary, which is Golgotha, is where Jesus delivers the destroying blow to Satan's head. Because Satan is a spiritual being, so he doesn't have a literal head that can be crushed. So the name Golgotha, place of the skull, where Jesus crushes Satan's head, is symbolic of that of defeating Satan. So that's why the Gospels spell out the name of Golgotha, the name of that place, because that's where Jesus defeated Satan in fulfillment of the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. Now, Abraham was another who received a promise from God regarding, regarding Jesus. And the promise, uh, which we find in Genesis 12, so again, this is going back to the very first book of the Bible. And God says to Abram, the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your land, your relatives, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth will find blessing in you. And Abram came from Ur of the Chaldees, which is a pagan land. Uh, he came from a pagan culture, but God calls him personally and his wife, Sarah, to come to the land that he's going to give the, his descendants, the Israelites, many centuries later down the line. And so also God says to Abraham, look up at the sky and count the stars if you can, just so he added, will your descendants be? And so when he made this promise, Abraham was very old and he and his wife had no children. She was past childbearing years. So this was a remarkable promise that God tells him he's going to have descendants, mul a multitude like the stars. And so God, if you notice, his, his name is Abram when God speaks to him, which means exalted father. And then God changes his name to Abraham, which means father of many. 
So there's only a few people that get their name changed in the Bible, but when they do, there's a reason for it because they've got a special role to play in God's plan of salvation. And so this promise is initially fulfilled through Abraham's son, Isaac, who he had with his wife, Sarah. And so through them, through him, the entire world will be blessed. Now, the, the Jewish people originally were supposed to be the light to the world. You know, they were to live in covenant relationship with God, to be holy, to show his, his love and goodness to the world and his truth. But they failed pretty miserably, miserably at that. So really, ultimately, this prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who fulfills it perfectly. Later on, a few centuries later, we have King David. And King David, the promise made to him is uh, in 1 Kings. Moreover, the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days have been completed and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, sprung from your loins, and I will establish his kingdom. He it is who shall build a house for my name and I will establish his royal throne forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. If he does wrong, I will reprove him with a human rod and with human punishments. But I will not withdraw my favor from him as I withdrew it from Saul, who was before you. Your house and your kingdom are firm forever before me. Your throne shall be firmly established forever. So Saul that he's speaking of here was the first king of Israel, and God originally intended to be their king, but they insisted they wanted a human king like all the other kingdoms. And so God cho chose Saul, who from all human appearances looked like a good, good candidate, but he turned out to be terrible. So God decided that's it for Saul and none of his descendants uh, would become king. And so that was the end of Saul's dynasty. And then God chose David, who he called a man after his own heart. And because David was, for the most part, faithful to God, he made this special covenant with him, this promise that he would have a descendant who would rule forever. And so this is an everlasting throne and kingdom. Now, this promise began with the reign of David's son, Solomon, and it continued through a direct line of 19 successors. However, this dynasty collapsed because of the sin of the Israelites uh, Israel was split after Solomon uh, into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. Israel, the northern kingdom, just went totally into apostasy. They, they had their own syncretistic religion. And then the southern kingdom of Judah maintained the faith for a while longer. But eventually they became very wicked. And God allowed the Babylonians to conquer them and bring them into exile for 70 years in Babylon. And so that's where the dynastic line seemed to cease to exist. However, in Matthew's gospel, we see that the line of David was not destroyed. And normally biblical genealogies can be boring to read if you don't really know what they're about. There's a reason they're in there. And so Matthew and Luke stress Jesus's genealogical descent from David legally through Joseph and then biologically through Mary, because remember, Joseph is not Jesus's biological father, so but he has a legal he has legal descent through Joseph, and then he has biological descent through Mary. And then if we look at Matthew's gospel, and remember Matthew's gospel is written to a Jewish audience, so they're going to be aware of these prophecies and promises. So Matthew divides Jesus's genealogy into three sets of fourteen, and David's name adds up to fourteen in Hebrew. And then Zerubbabel is the last Davidic descendant mentioned in the Old Testament, but his descendants are listed in Matthew's genealogy, showing that the Davidic royal line has continued up to the time and including Jesus. So this would have been exciting news for the Jews of Jesus' time to know that that Davidic line did not cease. And then Jesus is given the Messianic title, Son of David, which elicits in the Jewish listeners of the time the long-awaited restoration of the kingdom in its earthly historical form as it was under King David. And this is where 
there was misunderstanding of the kind of kingdom and the kind of Messiah that Jesus was going to be. People had their own preconceived ideas, which led to misunderstanding and which led to opposition from some people ultimately, because Jesus did not fulfill their idea of the Messiah. And so Christ, which is the Greek word for Messiah, which means anointed one, and this was the title of the Davidic kings when they were anointed at their coronations. And also at Jesus' baptism in the Jordan, the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And when you read the Old Testament accounts, which all the scripture references are in your handout that you were emailed. I don't have them up here on the slide, but they're in your handout if you want to look them up. The Holy Spirit would come upon the king when he was anointed. So the baptism of Jesus is his anointing as the messianic king who fulfills that prophecy. Um, and I got ahead of myself here. And then also the Jordan River Valley where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. It represented new beginnings and new life because this was where the Israelites crossed into the promised land after you know, their uh, exodus from Egypt and their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So there was an expectation of new beginnings here. Another promise is the promise of the forgiveness of sins. So in several places in the Old Testament, there, there it speaks of a new covenant that promises the forgiveness of sins and freedom from sins. And there's also a non-biblical source, which is from the, it's the poem of the Four Nights, which is an ancient Passover poem used in synagogue liturgy. It mentions four events that happened on the same calendar day as the Passover feast. First was the creation of the universe. Second was God's covenant with Abraham. Three was Israel's deliverance from Egypt. And four was the future Messianic king was expected to be, bring redemption to the Jews, which Jesus did accomplish through his passion and death during Passover. And so those are the, the major promises that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And now we're going to actually get to the theology of the incarnation, what, what this is all about and why this is so distinctive. So first of all, Jesus's existence did not begin at the incarnation. So Jesus is, uh, as the son of God, he is the second person of the Holy Trinity. Uh, he's, one of, he's the second person, one of three divine persons who exist in a hierarchy of relationship. It's not a hierarchy of power, importance. It's just relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father begets the Son. It's this eternal generation from the Father. And then the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. He's the love of the Father and the Son. And then Jesus is the Son from all eternity. He did not become the Son upon his earthly existence. He was and is always the Son. And I emphasize this because there are some non-Catholic theologians who are putting forth the idea that Jesus became the Son at the Incarnation. He became the Son of Man, but he was always from all eternity the Son of God. Now, in the Incarnation, the eternal divine Son assumed a human nature. That means he took on a human nature, the body and soul of a human becoming fully man while remaining fully God with no mixing of his two natures. So this is very different from Greek mythology where you had Greek gods, uh, you know, having relations with human women and they give birth to demigods that are half man, half God. So this is very different. This is nothing like anything else in human mythology. So this is a divine person assuming a completely different nature while having both natures, neither one of them, they're not mixed together. So the theological term for this is the hypostatic union. Hypostasis means person in Greek. So it's the union of two natures in one divine person. So Jesus is one divine person with two natures, human and divine. So in his full humanity, he possesses a human soul and will. And in the Eucharist, we receive the whole Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, because wherever Jesus' humanity is, his divinity is there also. So we, we, we receive the entire complete Christ when we receive him in the Holy Eucharist. And look at this 
this icon here, this is the this is called the uh, Christ the Ponto Crater, the ruler of all. This is a very classic icon. And icons are teaching pictures, basically. They teach theology. There's a reason for everything in them. And so if you'll notice Jesus' hand, the position of his hand, he's got two fingers bent down, touching the thumb, and then he has two fingers pointing up. Now, sometimes it'll differ which, which fingers are together, but he'll always have three fingers together and two fingers together. And that's pointing to this truth of the three fingers touching are the three persons of the Holy Trinity. So this is saying Jesus is one of those three persons. And then the two fingers by themselves are the two natures of Christ, human and divine. So whenever you see Jesus with his hand in that position, that's the truth that's being conveyed in that image. And as it says in John 1, 14 through 15, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten Son from the Father. So this is the central mystery of our faith. Uh, and this is from the Catechism, par paragraph 463. Belief in the true incarnation of the Son of God is the distinctive sign of Christian faith. Quote, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Such is the joyous conviction of the church from her beginning, whenever she sings the mystery of our religion, he was manifested in the flesh. And this might seem really obvious to us, especially if you've grown up in a Christian uh, faith, um, and you might take this truth for granted, but there's a lot of different Jesuses out there. And one of the handouts you have are some early heresies about Jesus. It took that was like what the challenge was for the first three or four centuries of the church was who is Jesus? How exactly, you know, you know, his nature and everything. How do we define this? Because we want to know the true Christ. So there's a Jehovah's Witness Christ who's not God. He's St. Michael the Archangel. There's the Mormon Jesus who's the brother of Satan and who's just one of many gods. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of different Jesuses out there. So we can't say you hear a lot of people say, well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in Jesus, because we need to make sure we're believing in the true Jesus, the Jesus revealed in the Bible. Um, another thing, the incarnation, it reveals the humility of God. And this is a passage from Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And this is something, another thing that, you know, if we've grown up in a Christian faith, it's, it's easy to also take this for granted, the humility of God in becoming a man, to take on a human nature, that and not just become a man but in humble circumstances because we know he was born in a stable um he was the king of the whole universe he wasn't born in a palace he wasn't born in a beautiful bed with a beautiful bedspread he was laid in a manger it wasn't dignitaries and royalty that came to visit him it was shepherds and shepherds were like the lowest of the low on the totem pole of the social order so we see jesus coming in very humble circumstances, and and we need to imitate that in ourselves. Uh, that should be something for us to imitate, that if God can be limited in, in humble circumstances, that if we ever find ourselves in those circumstances, to not despise that or complain about it, but to give thanks to God that we can share uh, a, a life like his. Um, and this is another passage too, he went down. Now, this is after they found him in the temple. Remember, he, they, they were going back home, and after three days, they realized, wait, he's not with us. So they search for three days, and they find him. He's a 12-year-old boy teaching the elders in the temple. And so it says here, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor before God and man. And when I was meditating on this mystery, when I was praying the rosary, I, I just think about the 12-year-old boy Jesus who's God, and he's not letting himself 
show that he's God when he's talking to these teachers of the law who are supposed to know God and they don't recognize that he's God and how cool it is that he's he's this 12 year old boy and he's not saying he's God you know he could be saying I am the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and he doesn't do that and then he obeys his human parents imagine that the God of the universe obeying humans the humility of that is incredible and, and that's a stumbling block for people that are coming outside of a Christian mindset to believe that God in his greatness and majesty could possibly humble himself to the level of becoming, take on a created nature and then obey humans. It, it's a scandal. It's a scandal to people. Another thing about the incarnation is it's a link between heaven and earth. And this is a quote from Archbishop Fulton Sheen in the life of Christ. Bethlehem became a link between heaven and earth. God and man meet here and looked each other in the face. In the taking of human flesh, the Father prepared it, the Spirit formed it, and the Son assumed it. He who had an eternal generation in the bosom of the Father now had a temporal generation in time. He who had his birth in Bethlehem came to be born in the hearts of men. For what would it profit if he was born a thousand times in Bethlehem, unless he was born again in man? But to all who did receive him, to those who have yielded him in their allegiance, he gave the right to become children of God. And again, this is something we don't see in any other religion, where you see this bridge of earth and heaven. Another Thing flowing from the incarnation is this incarnational sacramental principle. So in the incarnation, Jesus unites spirit and matter. He's got a physical body and he, th those get reunited again in perfect harmony because when Adam and Eve were created, they were spiritual and physical beings. They had a human, a spiritual soul. They had a physical body, but when they fell, when they sinned, all those desires got out of whack you know they started to get instead of letting reason control them and virtue they were controlled by their passions uh, it could be lust it could be greed it could be jealousy whatever uh you know comfort uh you know we have a an ism called hedonism which is where you exist you live for pleasure physical pleasure and so all that got out of whack in human nature but in jesus it comes back together in perfect harmony and so because we're physical beings, we're not disembodied spirits. And so we experience, uh, we experience everything we learn through our five senses. And so God, honoring this nature that he's given us, this physical and spiritual nature, he communicates his grace through physical means in the sacraments. All the sacraments are conveyed through some sort of physical matter, oil, water, a human hand, you know, different, different materials, but all those sacraments are given through physical means. It's, it's spiritual grace given through physical means, because again, we are physical embodied creatures. And so also we have sacred images. This is why we have sacred images to help us lift our minds and hearts up to God and holy things, because again, we perceive through our five senses. And so these come out of that incarnational principle. And this is a quote from St. John Damascene, who's one of the early church fathers. Previously, God, who has neither a body nor a face, absolutely could not be represented by an image. But now that he has made himself visible in the flesh and has lived with men, I can make an image of what I have seen of God and contemplate the glory of the Lord, his face unveiled. And so, oops, let me go back. So let me talk a minute about images, because this is a question that comes up, uh, especially when you talk to Protestants, but, you know, Muslims or Jews, is why do we have images? Because doesn't it, doesn't, don't the Ten Commandments forbid it? But actually, if you go back to the Ten Commandments, it forbids the making of graven images and not to worship them. It says, do not make any false representation of any other gods and do not bow down and worship them. But if you look in the book of Exodus at the building of the temple, it's full of images. It's full of images of plants and animals. And even on the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the Holy of Holies of the temple, 
there's there were God ordered Moses to carve two cherubim on the mercy seat of the ark. So cherubim are angels, and those were graven images of angels. So even that command to not make graven images was not an absolute prohibition of images. It was a prohibition of making images of false gods with the intent of worshiping them. But again, now that God has taken on a human form that visible, wow, all the more we can make images now. We can make images of God because Jesus came in the flesh. So the purposes of the incarnation. So Jesus, we know, I think most of us came to die for our sins to save us from sin so we could become children of God through adoption. We're not children of God by nature. We're children of wrath by nature because we're born separated from God because of original sin. But through adoption, through baptism, we receive grace and the Holy Spirit. And that makes us partakers of the divine nature. That's how we become like God. We don't become divine, but we share through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and through the life of God's grace in us. And Thomas Aquinas says, the only begotten Son of God wanting to make us sharers in his divinity, assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. And again, that's not literal. We don't obviously become divine, but we become like God in sharing in his holiness, uh, reflecting his image perfectly, which we don't do. We have his image, but it's marred by sin. And then this is from 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. And one of the terms used for this is divinization. So if you hear that word divinization, that just means becoming more like God in holiness. It doesn't mean becoming literally divine. And even Jesus' name, the Hebrew version of his name is Yeshua, which means God saves. And Jesus is the Greek form. So even his name reflects the purpose of the incarnation. But also the incarnation is to reveal God to man and man to himself. Because we need Jesus to really understand our complete, perfect destiny. Because the Jews had a concept of eternal life but they did not have a full understanding of what that all that entailed and, and what the fullness of life could be on earth uh, through, through divine grace. So St. John Paul II, who we celebrate today, he said, Jesus is the human face of God and the divine face of man. Again, those two natures. And then Gaudium et Spes, which is one of the documents of Vatican II. The truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light? For Adam, the first man, was a type of him who was to come, Christ the Lord. Christ, the new Adam, in the very revelation of the mystery of the Father and of his love, fully reveals to man to himself and brings to light his most high calling. And again, St. John Paul II in Divis and Misericordia, which was one of his encyclicals, it means rich in mercy, Human nature, by the very fact that it was assumed not absorbed in him, has been raised in us also to a dignity beyond compare. For by his incarnation, he, the Son of God, in a certain way, united himself with each man. And so, even though in the, in the, the natural order, angels are above us, but in the realm of grace, we are greater than angels. This is something that even angels don't partake of. They do not partake in this mystery, this life of grace, the way we will. We do now and what we will in heaven. Even the angels don't. So this is a very special destiny unique to man, but there's no way we would know this without the incarnation of Christ and his revealing this because Jesus reveals what we are made for. We're made for union with him and eternal union with him in heaven and perfect communion with God for all eternity. And also he came to establish his kingdom on earth. And this is from Matthew 16. So Jesus says to his disciples, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and all this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So the kingdom is embodied in Jesus Christ himself. It's also present in the heart of the believer through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because remember, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. And then it's also the church, which is the mystical body of, of Christ. And I want to explain this passage here from Matthew a little bit. Because you have to know the Old Testament to really understand fully what's going on here. So when Jesus is talking to Simon, and notice Simon Peter Simon is, was his name. He was given at birth, but Jesus changes his name to Peter, which means rock. And so he tells them, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. And he goes, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So if you go back to a passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 22, there is a passage where there is, you had King David or one of his descendants, it was one of his descendants at that time, they had what was called the royal steward or the master of the palace, who was like an administrative deputy for the king. He would govern in the king's absence. He was given a literal key over his shoulder as a symbol of being able to govern in the king's place in his absence. And so he basically helped the king rule the kingdom. So this passage, any Jew listening to Jesus speak this, which his apostles would know what he's talking about, He's referring back to that kingdom. Remember, he fulfills that promise to David to have a kingdom that will last forever. He's making Peter his administrative deputy in his kingdom. So he's giving Peter the keys to the kingdom. And then he goes, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is governing and teaching authority. And he's giving it to Peter. And he says, whatever Peter binds or looses on earth will be will receive a reciprocal binding and loosen in heaven. So this is very unique authority given to Peter. And then later on, he'll give this authority of binding and loosing to the other apostles and, and by extension, their successors. But only Peter has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So he is establishing the church as his kingdom on earth, which is going to exist on earth until he returns in glory uh, to claim his church. So those are, those are all the purposes of the incarnation. And I, let me see, click out of that and get back to Zoom. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, now I'm back, sorry. <laughs> Joan, is that, is that the presentation then? That's it. All right. Uh, instead of going into breakout rooms, since we're kind of late and we, we took a lot of time away from you uh, by some of the other things that we were doing, uh, I'd like to open this up really to uh, a Q&A. &A. And uh, it's your chance to, to stump the guest, ask her a question she, she can't <laughs> handle. Ask Deacon Bill the hard ones. Joan. Oh, no. Hey, Joan, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, that quote by St. Uh, John Paul II, Jesus is the human face of God and the divine face of man. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because, you know, one would think it would be the other way around, so to speak. Well, remember what Jesus said to Philip when Philip said, show us the Father? He goes, haven't I been with you long enough that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Because basically, it's it's not just his face, it's his whole humanity. You know, through his humanity, he's revealing the Father to us. You know, through his miracles, his power, his teaching. Does that help? That. Can I add something okay. to that, Joan? Yeah, add to it, please. <laughs> so, uh, I just I want everybody to understand um, our faith is based upon a relationship. And uh, I think this comes through loud and clear in the incarnation. Um, 
And uh, it's not just about uh, keeping laws and, and doing things, but it's living in a relationship. And that relationship is given to us through baptism because we become, as, as Paul said, adopted sons and daughters of the Father um, and through our baptism. Um, in fact, again, going back to that first part of Ephesians, because we were chosen in Christ Jesus to become the adopted sons of the Father, sons and daughters of the Father. So we are in a relationship. That's what the essence of uh, religion is. It's, it's about a relationship. And uh, what Jesus came to do was exactly what the word religion says. The, uh, this is your, your Latin uh, session for tonight. Uh, the word religion is made up of a couple of uh, Latin words. If you've ever had to do any of this in, in English, it's re ligare. Ligare means to bind. You've heard of the term ligament. Ligaments, if you're a medical person, bind things together. They bind bones, I guess, together. I'm not much of a uh, medical person, but I know a little bit. And it means to bind. And what is the first part is the re. When you say repeat, you mean to say it again. And to re ligare means to bind again. What does Jesus rebind? Jesus rebinds a busted relationship that occurred right there at the beginning that Joan was talking about. And it's over the centuries, uh, the Jewish people are prepared for that rebinding in Jesus Christ. And so in him, that one person, the second person of the Trinity, he, he binds both the human to the divine. That's a, that's a mystery. That's a mystery. Um, but uh, in studying the New Testament, the, the Gospels especially, we come to realize that, that that is seen in Jesus Christ. Um, and it is in, in and through the sacraments, baptism, confirmation, all the sacraments, that we encounter Christ and in a, in, a, in a real way, in a real way, we also, in our baptism, joined in Christ to the Father. Um, that's something you can chew on for a little while uh, and, and think about. But our faith is based, it's, 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 it's a relationship, which is more than just keeping commandments. Go ahead. Somebody else have a question? Sure. Sure. Don't all speak at one time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... I I'd just like to share something with you. Um, it happened uh, a few years ago here at St. Bart's. We had a, a visionary uh, come, come in to do a presentation at the church. And she had been visited by our, our Blessed Mother, um, Mary. And uh, she sort of explained um, what Mary looked like to her. And she had, you know, sort of honey colored eyes and she, she went through the features. And the last um, experience that this woman had was she was visited by, by Jesus. And she said that it was like looking at our blessed mother, but a man. And it suddenly struck me that, well, that's what you would expect because Jesus only had his mother's genes. Mm. So it would be look, you know, when, you know, anybody's had a child, um, especially a baby, you know, you, you, you're looking at the baby and going, oh, well, he's got your eyes, you know, he's got, he's got your nose. Uh, but, you know, when Mary looked at Jesus, she would have been saying, yeah, 
he has my nose, he has my eyes, he has, yeah. So um, that really struck me um, at that moment in time. I think that was probably the year that I, I became a Catholic. Mm. So I thought I'd just share that with you. Yeah, thank you. John, what, what were some of the questions that you had? Uh, um, oh, go ahead. No, ladies first, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, uh, Deacon Paul, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> hopefully you can explain. I will give you, to, give you the keys of heaven of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I, I confuse that a little bit. Can you explain that a little bit more? Please. Well, the, the disciples or the apostles would have been listening to that with Jewish ears. And um, in Isaiah, I think 22, um, God becomes upset with the, um, forget his name. I wonder if I could. I think it was Shebna. Shebna. Or, yeah. or Eliakim. I forgot which one replaced which one. No, Eliakim is the one that he's going to uh, replace Shebna with. Oh, okay. All right. with Shebna because Shebna is uh, building a monument to himself. And so he, he, um, he gets rid of Shebna and he's going to install install Eliakim. Um, let me see if I can be as good as my Protestant brothers and, um, and see. Ah, oh, look at that! Almost. Let me see if I've got twenty-two. Let's see if that's correct. Am I correct? Yes, I'm correct. Chapter twenty-two, Isaiah. Um, and so on that day I will summon my servant Eliakim son of Hilkiah I will clothe him with your robe gird him with your sash and give over to him your authority he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder and when he opens no one shall shut when he shuts no one shall open I will fix him like a peg in a sure spot to be a place of honor for his family. Uh, that, is, that is the kind of authority that um, um, the master of the palace had complete authority in the Davidic, in the Davidic kingship. And uh, he was not the king, but he was a master of the palace. And if you think in terms of the church, Peter, is the master of the palace. Uh, Jesus, it's his kingdom. He's the son of David. He's the inheritor of the kingdom. But the master of palace is, is Peter. And what Peter shuts is shut. And what he opens is open. And so there was, there was that sense of real authority that those disciples would have understood because they, they knew this passage. Um, and it uh, perhaps makes it a little bit uh, more, uh, a little bit more open or more understandable. Yep. Are we getting to what you're asking? What is your question? Uh, if I'm, am I asking, answering your question, Manny? The kingdom, Manny, are you with me? Yes, yeah, sorry, Deacon Bull. Claire's in charge of the computer, so I'm a little bit slow. Oh. <laughs> All right. Where's the question? It, is, am I answering your question? No. Uh, no, not really, because. Uh, what is your question then? Moms and, and okay, Dick, well, I'm going to ask this question. All right. See, she's in charge. Um, <laughs> a few years ago, you had a very good explanation on how you explained about what you bind on earth, bound in heaven, and what you. Yeah. Okay, 
And I think you used an analogy of someone being in jail. <laughs> I don't know if you remember. <laughs> well, I was talking about that's the definition of a sacrament. The by, the by, the bond. We always talk, we talk in terms of the sacraments. We talked about them as a sign, as a sign and symbol. But actually, in the uh, Roman understanding of the word sacrament in everyday language, the sacrament was a bond. It was like a bond. I don't mean that bond. I mean bound. You're, you're mixing up my accent. Okay. <laughs> Not bond, bound. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's the same, it's the same concept, though. Okay. Uh, we are bound. Right. We are tied. The Cocoville doesn't have to do, I think you mentioned it was you or Father, one of the priests. They mentioned the answer that they gave to that question that many and Claire have is, is the forgiveness that the priests through the sacrament of confession are answering that request that Jesus Christ did when he, they said, through, through the confession, whatever you forgive is forgiven. Whatever is not forgiven is not forgiven. So that's the delegation through the sacrament of confession that Jesus does to Peter and therefore Peter to his disciples, isn't it? Well, that's, that's within the context of the binding and loosing power of the church. Now, that's the first thing that Jesus tells the disciples on the evening of the resurrection. Peace be with you. Whatever you bind on earth, or uh, your sins are forgiven you. Whatever you, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, those you retain are retained. That's the binding and loosing power that's exhibited. So I, I don't, am I... What, what is, what is the, I'm still trying to find, what is the essence of the question? Well, is it about specifically what authority that applies to? Is that what you're asking? What is the nature of the binding and loosing, Manny? Yes. Okay, so that is, I, I kind of mentioned it in passing, and I didn't spend a lot of time on it, is that binding and loosing is rabbinic terminology about referring to teaching, authority, and disciplining. And so this is giving Peter ultimate disciplining and teaching authority. This is infallibility is implicit here when uh, because God can't ratify error. So that's why there are things that only the Pope uh, can, like to, for example, to uh, release somebody from religious vows, that kind of thing. Only the Pope can do that. There are certain other things that only the Pope can do. He's the only one who has the authority to do it. And then also when it comes to teaching, because the, the mission of the church is to teach and to preach. And then we also have to have discipline, like, for example, excommunication, which you don't really hear much about. And that's where somebody is not allowed access to the sacraments for whatever they're a heretic or they're in public scandal, mortal sin, whatever. Um, and so they... You, they used to do this a lot more often, but they would be excommunicated, which was meant to bring them to repentance. And so there were, so that, for example, is something only a bishop can do. But then, so, but that's a discipline, though. And then that's an example of a discipline is, is to, um, you know, to excommunicate, which bishops have that authority. But there are certain things that only the Pope has authority to do. For example, only the Pope can define a dogma ex cathedra, which is which means from the chair means he is formally saying, I'm going to define this teaching, which happened has only happened twice. Uh, there in 18, it was the doc, the the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in the 1850s, I think, and then the the dogma of the Assumption of Mary in 1950 by Pope Pius XII, and it. And it was, they basically, people just wanted clarification on what those teachings were. So those two different popes made definitive, infallible definitions of 
what the church taught on those things. And that's the only two times that that authority has been given. Uh, I mean, is practiced. But does that make sense? It's like, but like for example, when Pope, like you know, when Pope Francis declared a jubilee year of mercy, where you could do certain things and receive indulgences, and priests were given authority to forgive women who had had abortions, they wouldn't have to go you know, to especially that, that's all papal authority. That's ultimate authority that only the Pope can do. Only he can do things that are for the whole church, you know, that are binding on the whole church. Like if there's an ecumenical council, he has to ratify it for it to be binding on the church. Because if it doesn't get ratified by the Pope, it's not binding on the church. So it's, it refers to specific things that as head of the church, only he has the authority to do. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, then going back to the infallibility, you know, the way I understand it, if, if the Pope puts out whatever and he calls it infallible, that, that basically means now it's going to be written into canon law and this is basically we've got to follow what it says. Who decides... <coughs> how do we know he's really leading us down the right path and not the wrong path? You know, you know what I'm saying? How do we know yeah. determines well, if this is true or not? Well, basically the Pope is only given, he only has the gift of infallibility when he's teaching in his official capacity to the whole church in a matter of, do of faith and morals. He has no infallibility when it comes to politics or anything else and it's not that everything the pope says and does is infallible because the thing is that it has to be in line with what the church has taught for 2000 years because like pope francis has recently said things that are contrary to what the church teaches so those are not infallible statements so again it's a very limited circumstance in which the pope which was actually this was determined in the vatican one in the 1800s spelled out what are the circumstances in which a pope is infallible and and most of the things they do is most of the time they're just teaching what the church has already taught so if it's infallible teaching it'll just be infallible just by the virtue of its infallible church teaching not because he's personally infallible and so and then there's you know there's other things that are more their prudential it's like their own personal judgment but it's not a church teaching per se. It's, you know, like with capital punishment, what Pope Francis has said about that, that's his prudential opinion. That's not church teaching. Uh, he can't obliterate 2000 years of church teaching in a statement. So it, I know it gets, it, it's kind of, there's, there's more detailed articles that go into a lot more detail about what kind of documents are more official and weighty than others, um, you know, because obviously anything private, private correspondence, you know, private conversation or just off the cuff interviews, there's no weight there like there would be in an official document. But even the official document isn't necessarily protected. Basically, his job is just to guard the faith. It's not to just go around making infallible pronouncements. Um, if that makes sense. Like an example of this was Pope Paul VI in 1968. This was after the birth control pill had been on the market for several years. There were a lot of Catholic theologians and even bishops that were saying, hey, we need to re-look at the church's position on contraception, you know. And so Pope Paul VI assembled a commission of theologians to look at it. And some of them were in favor of contraception. And when they came up with their report, he totally disregarded it and wrote Humanae Vitae, which was completely perfectly in line with what the church had taught for 2000 years. And he addressed it to the today's time. And he actually made four predictions that all came true. You know, what would happen with the widespread acceptance of contraception and that every single one of them has come true. So, you know, it was infallible in the sense that he was just reiterating church doctrine, 
he may not have been personally, but see, you can see the work of the Holy Spirit there because he went against the, it, what his commission was recommending and against kind of the way the world and people in the church were going. They were saying, we need to change the church teaching. And he's like, you know, no, nope, we're going to reaffirm it because that's infallible teaching. That, that teaching cannot be changed. So he just, you know, in that instance, God used him to reaffirm what the church taught. And, and uh, John, can I have a question? Okay. Um, is there any other pope that has made um, infallible expressions? Uh, oh yeah, there have been other popes that have been wrong on certain issues, but they, that what what infallibility protects them from is introducing false teaching into the body of church teaching. Like a, a pope could personally be a heretic. I mean, hopefully not, but he could go around and say heretical things all day, but that gift of infallibility will keep him, he's not going to be able to introduce that into church teaching. Like he might confuse people, he might say things that don't line up with the church teaches, but again, this comes back to we have 2,000 years of church teaching. We know what the church teaches. So even if a pope were to get up and say things contrary to it, we know he's speaking in error if he does that. And we know that we don't have to listen to that because he doesn't have the authority to change church teaching. If it's, if it's settled, defined, infallible teaching, he can't change it. So, uh, but there, have, there was actually a, a pope in the past who... I think it was Honorius, who they actually dug him up and put him on trial as a heretic. He was dead. <laughs> he was buried. It was kind of wild. But yeah, but there have been a few popes that, uh, one of them, I forgot what view he held, but he did accept correction and he changed his mind on it. But again, he wasn't presenting that as church teaching. He just had a wrong view on a theological issue. So infallibility doesn't mean everything the Pope says and writes is going to be infallible. It just means that he, God is not going to allow him to introduce any false teaching. Like he would not be able to make an ex cathedra definition that would be wrong. That would be impossible. God, God would not permit that. He would either move him in the right direction. There's actually a case of Pope Vigilius in the, I think it was in the early sixth century and he was, uh, he was a deacon. He was a very unscrupulous character. Um, and he actually, it's thought he had a hand in the demise of Pope Agapetus. So this is during the time of the Byzantine Empire in the 6th century. And at the time of the Monophysite heresy, which was a heresy that said Jesus' divine nature absorbed his human nature. So he only had a divine nature. And this was this heresy was very common in the eastern part of the world there, and the empress, the Byzantine empress, was either either she totally embraced the heresy or she was sympathetic to it, because she she was backing a Monophysite bishop, and so the pope at the time, Agapetus, went and deposed him and put a a true Catholic bishop in there who wasn't a heretic, and she didn't like that. So anyway, that Pope mysteriously dies, and then she makes a deal with Vigilius that she'll help him become Pope if he'll promise to reinstate that Monophysite heretical bishop, and she was going to give him 700 pounds of gold and all this, and do some other stuff, and, and I don't remember all the details. So he starts heading back to Rome, but in the meantime, somebody else got elected Pope, and this was before they had cardinals, so there was a different way of electing them. So what she did is she conspired to have that Pope deposed and sent into exile, and he died of starvation, and then Vigilius became Pope. And nobody opposed him because they were afraid of him because he was that bad of a character. So anyway, she, she was waiting for him to make good on the deal because he was supposed to reinstate the Monophysite bishop in Constantinople and do some other stuff that she wanted him to do. And so she got a little impatient with him and wrote him a letter and it's like, okay. And he wrote her back saying, I can't do it. I'm, I'm a successor of the blessed apostle Peter. And he didn't do it. He didn't do any of that stuff he'd agreed to. He reaffirmed the Catholic faith. She wound up getting him removed from office 
and he wound up dying a very painful death of kidney stones, but he said he wrote that he was getting the just punishment for his sins. So he was he repented of his heresy and of his sin upon becoming Pope and did not carry out that plan to promote a her heretical bishop and a heretical teaching. So that's a pretty amazing example from history of God intervening in a dramatic way to 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 get a Pope going in the right direction. <laughs> so John, the other, the two, two times that the infallibility um, charism was uh, was uh, exercised was at uh, Immaculate Conception in 1856, and then again uh, in 1950 with the Assumption. But it wasn't just that he decided right. to do that. It was in conjunction with the consensus of the bishops throughout the world. Right, they were all consulted, right. and it was under that circumstance that the whole church came together, and he pronounced yeah. made that right. Uh, so it's that's good. a good point to make. The Pope can't make up teaching; he can't change teaching. Right. Uh, he's there to conserve it. Let me give you okay for the for example on the immaculate uh, well the Assumption of Mary. This is an example of the limits of papal authority because there there's two traditions on Mary that. In the East, the predominant tradition is that she chose to die before her assumption in imitation of Jesus, because remember, she was conceived without original sin, so she was not subject to death like we are. And so the Eastern tradition is that she chose to die in imitation of her son, and then she was assumed body and soul into heaven, whereas in the West, it's kind of more prevalent that she was assumed directly body and soul into heaven. So when Pope Pius XII wrote out the solemn definition of the dogma, he just said at the end of her earthly existence, he doesn't say anything about whether she was still alive or if she died. She was assumed body and soul into heaven. So that question, that leaves it open for Catholics to believe one tradition or the other because the church has not, he did not dogmatically decide whether she died or whether she was taken up into heaven alive. So that's an example. You know, he, he was aware of the two traditions, and so he just remained silent and, and just affirmed that. Mm -hmm. And John, maybe it's too late to ask this question, um, and I don't know if it's a proper question, but since it's so in the air today, um, maybe for... Or later, or you can send us an email. Um, that what the the Pope said this week would that be understood? Like it is not because he's making reference to the civil life of people, right outside mm -hmm. of the church. So that would that be considered as not as something contrary to what the the the, the church has been teaching in relation to the. The dusty part of life of people? Well, it's actually a moral issue, and it actually has been decided by the church that we cannot condone civil unions. Okay. Yeah. I think it was uh, Pope the Benedict. Congregation, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, while well, Cardinal Ratzinger was in charge of it, it was uh, during the reign of Pope uh, John Paul II that they declared that that, yeah. Uh, yeah. That we cannot no. repeat. The Holy Father, Father again, Pope Francis. That's that was part of a, as I understand it. I haven't really researched this enough, but it's part of a of a documentary on his life or something, and uh, he said something to this effect. But he's he's speaking he's speaking uh, as. Uh, not as a Pope, you know, in, in, as an infallible statement. He may be, he but, may be wrong. But it's he contrary be to what other Popes have said before. It or is. They, they, yeah, it is. Yeah. If, if what he says is being reported accurately, and that, that's to be asked, that, that question is also to, has to be uh, discovered. I, well, I think as far as I know, it was. But again, it was an interview, I think. And so he's expressing 
he's not he's not speaking in a formal capacity as the teacher of the whole church saying this is the church teaching he's just expressing his thoughts on it which are contrary to what the church teaches but well, he's not confusing. yeah it's, it confuses people that's for sure we need yeah. to pray for him um but yeah it it's Nine o'clock. Okay. <laughs> Time. Uh, it's quite a discussion this evening. Um, so thank you, John. You did a beautiful job. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Yes. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, the morning of reflection Saturday. Um, let us um, all sort of quiet our minds and hearts for a moment and um, place those petitions, those needs that we have, um, that we wish the entire group to pray for. Let us think of them. And then together, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. The Almighty God bless all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a chat that came up and I didn't couldn't read it that quick. What's the I don't understand the candle. To have that were discussed earlier today that on Saturday people may have a candle ready for the for, for the morning of um, of reflection. Okay. Remember. I'm not sure. What is the candle for? Because we we said that. The, what the preparation that we're gonna talk to Valeria so that she can talk to the group to have her read to the people who have an environment one of the things what they can do. Um, okay, I don't that I, I'm not aware of that. She may communicate that to us. Um, that's a little something to expect. Okay. They might yeah. have a candle ready. For whatever it is that Valerie is going to <laughs> going to um, talk to us about, okay? okay? Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, night. y'all. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.